privacy and security principles, access, storage, and permissions. Now, businesses that store data about individuals on their systems are responsible for the security of the data and the privacy of their employees and customers of whom they have data stored about. The Privacy Act 1988 outlines 13 principles related to data in both the public and private sectors. Now, we're not going to look into all 13 of these principles, but we are going to have a look at three elements related to those principles, which also transfer into security as well. And that is those elements of access, storage and permissions. So firstly, we'll take a look at access and what access relates to is basically who can use specific data on a system or actually view specific information. So with access, we are doing it all the time every time we get onto a new system because we need to obviously log into the system in some way, shape or form. Now, there's a variety of methods to do this. There are things such as, which you'll be familiar with, login procedures, where you enter a specific login, which might be your email address or something specific to the platform you're using. And then in order to authenticate your login, you also enter in a password as well. And good passwords are made up of characters, numbers, and symbols, usually without meanings, making them hard to guess. We want complex passwords, so that way it's hard for people to guess what our passwords are when logging into a system. So there too, you'd be very familiar with. We also have a multi-factor authentication, which still make, may make use of logins and passwords, but then once you've done that first level of logging in and being authenticated, it then asks you to authenticate through another means, which could be that a message is sent to your phone via SMS or to your email, and then that gives you a pin. And then there's a second level of logging in where you have to enter that pin on another screen that went to your SMS message or email in order to authenticate once again. So when it's just two stages, that's two factor authentication. But obviously the greater the security access methods, the more multi-levels we go. And that's why we say multi-level authentication or MFA for sure. Now that refers to users actually just trying to log into a system in order to gain access. But then we also have an actual protection related to data entering or exiting a systems network. And that's where we have firewalls, which follow predetermined rules about the actual senders and receivers uh, exchanging data on a network and will essentially block data coming in from untrusted sources. And that's why we use firewalls. So not actually related to people logging in, but potentially trying to send data to a specific network, you know, in the case that it could be malicious. So they're all uh, just a few procedures related to access. Now, the next level we'll look at is that of storage. Storage relates to data being held on a system's devices, such as either the drives, such as hard drives or solid state drives, which are likely on RAID storage systems, so we can store large amounts of data, but also in the format of these uh, drives being a server for specific networks, where they're actually networked drives that multiple resources and nodes access in order to gain resources on a network, such as web servers and mail servers or database servers. All right, so that's where all the data is stored for the network or for the enterprise systems, which client systems access in order to access the system's resources. Now, this data must be protected at both a digital level, so the data that is actually stored on these drives and servers being safe from unauthorized access and corruption, but also at a physical level in saying that we don't want damage to happen to these hard drives or solid state drives. So we've got to think about storage at two levels of protection that we need to ensure that our data stays safe. So at a digital level, drives may be encrypted, which means when data is stored on them, it gets pretty much scrambled. So that way, if an unauthorized user somehow gets into that drive, what they will read is just some gibberish symbols that don't make any type of sense. Encryption is bound by either public or private keys, okay, which can be used for encryption, whether that be specific for this one device or can be more generally used in the case of public key encryption. But essentially, unless an authenticated user or a user in general has that key, it will be unreadable to them from that drive. So that's what encryption does. It scrambles information on the drive so that anyone who um, might have stolen that drive and then tried to gain access to that drive, the actual information will be unreadable. So that's at a digital level of protection. At a physical level, we've got a few categories. I already mentioned that these drives could be stolen. 
All right, so that's one threat to a physical actual threat to the actual system that people could try to actually take the drive itself. But then we also have things such as disasters, whether it be natural disasters such as floods, or it could be um, a, a disaster such as a fire occurring within the workplace. These can physically damage the drives. So we've got to have protection methods in place to protect us against these as well. So one method is just having this actual drives stored in cupboards or secure rooms that are physically locked and people need to authenticate to get into those physical rooms or into those safes, all right? And then we can also get specific safes that may be fireproof. Now, with these fireproof safes, now that can be difficult if it is actually still, we've got network cabling coming and all that. So while that might not be perfect for our live data, it kind of brings us to this final point on storage, that of having backups of data. So in the inevitability that damage does occur. So we did have some sort of natural disaster happen or a fire happened or someone did somehow steal our data or a virus took down our main operational system. We need secondary storage locations that have other drives that have our data saved on them. Now, this could be that we're backing up to another hard drive and that's where all our data is going and that is kept in a separate location in another safe location that is locked up, fireproof safe and all that. It could also be that we're using a secondary server such as a cloud server, such as iCloud or Dropbox that back up our data in the cloud. So that way, when we bring our system back online, we can hopefully retrieve data from the cloud provided we have internet access as well. So that can support us with our backing up and then obviously ensure that our data is securely stored. Even if we lose it, we can still do a re disaster recovery or recovery in general to bring the data back to the system and then install and copy it back to an operational system when we get things up and running again. The final category we'll look at is that of permissions. So we need to establish permissions because we've been mentioning authenticating users quite a bit already and that they should have access to the data on the network. But not all data on the network should be viewable by all authenticated users because certain people need data that is relevant to their jobs. And for other people in the enterprise, that data might not be relevant for them and therefore in order to maintain privacy, they shouldn't be viewing it. So we establish different levels of permissions in order to say who is the right to view specific information. And we try to correlate that with workers' jobs. So specific permissions may be assigned to authenticated users. So basically mapping it to certain accounts and logins. When this person logs in, they'll be able to see this. When another person logs in, they'll be able to see this information. Like I said, mapping it to their specific jobs, but also will control what they can do with that information. So some people will just be able to view the information and they will have read only rights to viewing that data. They can just see it and then they can obviously reference it when doing their own tasks. Others, though, may have the right to actually edit that information and change the records stored on the system. So that is a step above. We may want people still to be able to view information, but not actually edit it, but still give some input about it. That's when we have comment permissions. So they can't actually change the record, but they can leave notes and use uh, messaging systems within the actual system to actually leave a comment to say something about the data, might even be referencing the person who has the permission to change data to make some changes while still limiting who can actually make those changes. And then the final one is the big one because we are talking about privacy we need to limit who can actually share information. So who has the right to share documents, data and records on a system? And that may be specifically limited to managers within the system, having those rights to, in who they can share with and having that option to do it with specific data. So I hope this video has given you a bit of an understanding of some privacy and security principles that are put within systems in order to support the secure protection of data. That of controlling who can actually access systems and the data stored on it, which we can control through login procedures, passwords, multi-factor authentication and firewalls. And then the actual storage on data, of data on a system being secure, how it is stored on drives and servers. And then we can encrypt that data when it's actually in storage. And then to protect it from physical dangers, we can uh, store it in safe locations within protected rooms that are locked, uh, secure rooms, fireproof safes and all of that. But then also in worst case scenario that we are making regular backups and we're keeping those backups in separate locations so they can be called upon in a disaster recovery situation so that we can restore our system and we don't lose any data, even though the system will go through a bit of downtime in the interim. And then the final area of permissions. 
not just that everyone who is a part of an enterprise has a right to see all information. No, that we actually establish permissions that control who can see what data that is relevant to them, and then putting actual rules on permissions. Who can actually view data read only, who can edit data, who can comment data, and who essentially can share data with others so that we can ensure that people's data is kept private and we have security mechanisms in place in order to ensure that we are safe from cybersecurity threats.